friends, it's Pat with another episode of Let's Talk Travel. Uh, and if you've been following us this month, you will know that we've departed from our typical format of hosting guests from, from some segment of the travel industry. And uh, uh, while the focus is still remaining this month on travel, we've actually departed a little bit from what we normally do with, with hosting uh, some guests from inside the industry, uh, because all of our Dancing Moon people have been uh, doing interesting things, and we thought we would just share some of the the uh, knowledge and experience and insights that we have with you with our own people this month. And with that said, you got a glimpse of him. If if you have followed us for any length of time, you know Kevin. He's no stranger to you. Uh, Kevin's been around with Dancing Moon Travel since 2010, so a uh, familiar face and sense of humor that most of you uh, who follow us are well aware of, so welcome, Kevin. Thank you. Thank you. We are so glad you're here. Uh, and since 2010, we have been just kind of uh, doing this and that, and you have been an invaluable asset to Dancing Moon Travel. So, so tell us a little bit about that that relationship. Where did it start? <laughs> well, you know, it's it's kind of it's kind of a strange beginning. Uh, I, when I met you, I would actually own my own furniture consignment store that really wasn't going well, and uh, I was scanning through Craigslist, believe it or not. And you had posted uh, a, a notice or an ad in there that you were looking for someone that was interested in the travel industry or something. And I, and I, as a, I think more than anything, I was curious. <laughs> and so I contacted you, uh, we met. And uh, not long after that, uh, you offered me an opportunity to learn about the travel business and uh, I've stuck with it for what 12 years now well, 12 years it's it's hard to believe it's been that long but uh that was back when we were both in Atlanta yeah uh, so changes there as well where are you now Kevin <laughs> <laughs> well I'm in I'm in Ireland and uh I've been here now for five years and I have taken up residence in a uh town on the Irish Sea called Greystones, and there's a picture of it there. Um, oh, that's, that's lovely, Kevin. I haven't seen that before. That's uh, that's that's uh, the port of uh, Greystones, and then uh, in the bottom left-hand corner, there's a beach that's called South Beach, um, and then on, oh. if with the picture, if we were able to expand it wider, uh, you would be able to see North Beach. Um, I'm sorry, I got them re reversed. No, this is North Beach, and then South Beach is the other one. And then in the background, you can see the Wicklow Mountains. And so it's kind of a, a fun location. I'm <clears throat> halfway, I'm, I'm right on the Irish Sea, and I'm only uh, 20 minutes from the Wicklow Mountains and about a 30-minute uh uh, train ride into the city of Dublin. Wow, that that is beautiful there, Kevin. I'm th I thank you for showing that picture because I had not seen what a beautiful place you live. And uh, so with that said, I guess probably nobody will be terribly surprised that we're going to be talking about, where else? Ireland today. Why not? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, Kevin, you know, and you, you realize this, uh, that uh, Ireland is such a popular destination. Uh, you probably see Americans are pretty are just around everywhere during the height of the travel season. Can't uh, get away from them. <laughs> don't yeah, don't uh, hide your enthusiasm there. <laughs> uh, you, you know that really has Ireland has been one of the top travel destinations for for people for, for many, many years. Uh, wh why is it that you think that people are so drawn to visit Ireland? Well, there's a lot of reasons. And I, I think uh, uh, 
it's if you're a person that loves uh, history, it's there. If you're a person that loves uh, uh, jaw jaw dropping natural landscapes, uh, it's here. Um, uh, friendly people. Um, I mean, it's there. It really has it all. And and what's nice is I think it's an attraction too. Is it's a European country that people can easily get to, and for the most part, you don't have to worry about the language. Uh, I mean, if you go to, you can go to Spain or France or Italy, something like that. And you're always in the back of your mind, I think, thinking, well, how am I going to communicate? Not a, not an issue here. Yeah. You j just, uh, uh, th those are all great reasons. You know, another thing that, that I find that's that we frequently, uh, are, are asked about is, uh, People want to go because of family heritage. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a that's a big call to. I, I mean, some people will specifically state, "I want to go see this location because that's where my family originated." And uh, I know I'm 42 percent Irish. Uh, <laughs> my dad's side, pretty much, you know, uh, was you know over like the. 88% Irish. So it, it uh, is a, you know, a, a kind of more the English on my mother's side, but uh, so my roots are there as well. But you know, uh, I think the thing, Pat, for me, uh, I've, I've been coming here now for over 30 years. And uh, my first visit was here over 30 years ago. And what I, what attracts me, what I like is the history it's really amazing. I mean, I, I remember in the States when they made such a great big deal about the bicentennial and 200 years and all that. Well, uh, look at this. This is something in uh, an area called Newgrange, and it was a, a tomb um, that I, I actually recently toured that. And that tomb and there's several around it as well. That predates the pyramids by 500 My years. My word. How it's, big is that, Kevin? Uh, big. Big. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, the picture, it's hard to, it's hard to see. Um, I yep. can't remember the dimensions, but I was able to go up on top and walk around and they are, there was actually in the uh, beginnings of that uh, uh, several residents lived on top of that wow so so it's it's a large structure and um i was able to go inside um which was a little eerie uh they don't allow very many people in at a time and it's very small and compact and and it, uh, I'm not, I'm, I'm six, two. And I think the people back then must've been like four foot two or something because <laughs> how they got through those passages. I, I don't know. I had a little bit of a struggle, a little claustrophobic. Huh? <laughs> yeah. And then, and then just 20 minutes from my home is, is a, uh, monastic village, uh, called Glenda Lock that was developed or discovered, not discovered, uh, started in the sixth century. Mm -hmm. And there's still structures that are there from that. So, I mean, it's, mm -hmm. it's amazing that you can go and see these things that are so old. And I just really love that. So if you're into history, Ireland's got it. It's a good place. Wow. I love it. Uh, now, one of the things that people always want to know is when is a good time to travel? So what, what is the height of season? What's the customary window that uh, U.S. travelers like to come visit Ireland? Well, I, I believe the best uh, two or three months would be May, September, and into early October. Okay. Um, June, July, and August are maybe the best weather, but it's also the time that all those Americans 
come over and it's crowded. Uh, there's tourists everywhere. If you come in May and you come in September or October, the crowds are less and you don't feel so overwhelmed. Um, so that's, that's my recommendation is May, September, early October. I, I like that. And it's, it's kind of what we, we in, in the, the travel business, they kind of call shoulder season. It's the time of year when uh, it's good to go. Your weather is uh, beginning to be good, but it's not full-blown season when, when the throngs have arrived. So, uh, And rates are often better when you travel during those periods as well. You save a little money. I know June, July, and August you expect to pay a premium uh, and you want, if you, if you need to go during those months, focus folks, and you want to go to Ireland or pretty much any popular destination, please do not wait. We're seeing a lot of last minute travelers. Now I'm finding this and wanting to go to Alaska. I'm just sandwiching this in here, but uh, very, very difficult sometimes to find p travel has opened up. So find space for last minute travel plan ahead when you possibly can. Just just a word of advice there. Uh, Kevin, I know, and we've talked about this sometimes, I know that sometimes when people are considering traveling to, to Ireland, they reach out to you with questions. They know that you've got feet on the ground there and you're, you're an expert on that area. Uh, and, and they're really good. We love when, when tr our, our travelers are asking good questions before they leave home. Uh, you know things they're curious about, but don't haven't don't quite know uh, what they should do. But sometimes some of these questions can provide a bit of a chuckle. Uh, and, and just just w whether they're funny or not. Uh, what are some of the common questions that you've heard from people? Well, this one's not common, but it is funny, <laughs> and it's and it's current because I got this. Uh, happy 4th of July, Kevin. Do they celebrate the 4th with fireworks in Ireland just like they do here? <laughs> okay, I'm just going to leave it. <laughs> but <clears throat> Think about that, folks. <laughs> think about it. I'm not, I'm not going to follow up on that anymore. Uh, <laughs> I, I got a question here, too. Uh, I want to do a self-drive of Ireland. Uh, you know, Pat, Pat and I put together uh, group tours, but self-drive is also something that, that is very uh, popular. Very popular. Yeah. And someone asked me if they can rent a car at the airport, at the Dublin airport, and then drive into Dublin uh, to their hotel. And uh, that's, that's doable, but I do not, I highly do not recommend it. Uh, even the people in Ireland do not like to drive in Dublin. Uh, number one, when you get off the flight from the U.S., you're going to be jet lagged. You're going to be tired. You are then going to rent a car that you're going to not be familiar with, and you're going to be driving on the other side of the road and going into a basically a major city to get to your hotel and not all that combined is not, not good. What I recommend is, is there's plenty of public transportation at the Dublin airport to take you into Dublin city, take the public transportation, spend your, your days or a couple of days or however long you plan on being in Dublin. You can get around Dublin very easily with public transportation, hop on, hop off buses, there's trams, there's all sorts of way. It's a small, it's a big city, but it's small. You can actually navigate, self-navigate, walk around the entire thing if you want it. Once your time in Dublin is, is finished and you're wanting to explore the rest of Ireland, take the public transportation back to the airport, rent your car, then take off and avoid the big city. Good day. And plus, plus parking, I am sure. Oh, it, no. And, and, and uh, you know, you don't need to, to be buying gas, wasting your gas going into Dublin uh, to save, save that and get it later. And, and folks, by the way, if you know, if you're uncomfortable with taking public transportation or, you know, getting a, a 
whatever your method, we can easily arrange transfers for you as well to have somebody there to pick you up and take you direct to your hotel. Uh, so, so that's another service that we can provide for you. Uh, and then get you on the hop on hop off bus, get you a 48 hour pass. That's usually sufficient for most people to see what they want to see in Dublin before leaving the city for other places. So, uh, what else, Kevin, what other questions do you get? Uh, here's one. Uh, I get this asked all the time and we kind of alluded to it a little bit about what's the best time to visit Ireland, but specifically they're wanting to know when to avoid the rain, to go to avoid the rain. Uh, Ireland uh, has a reputation that is accurate in that it rains a lot. Uh, the kind of the funny story is uh, there's not a whole lot of difference between summer and winter. The only difference is the temperature of the rain. Um, <laughs> so, uh, that said, when if you look at rainfall totals, it's not significant. It's what they, uh, it, it could be a rainy day for several days in a row, but it might be a light mist or what they call a soft rain. Uh, if you come to Ireland, I recommend you pack a, a, a waterproof jacket of some sort. You don't need to have full weather gear and all that. But again, May, September, October is a good time to come. July, June, July, August, and we're right in the middle of, of July right now. It's been very dry. And we're, we've been, uh, we're been gonna be reaching up to 70 degrees. Oh my so word, it's a heat it's, wave. It is, <laughs> uh, it's, it's, it's rare that we ever get over 70. Uh, it's also rare that we ever get below 32. Uh, so, but 32 in Ireland next to the sea with a wet mist and gusts of wind is not a comfortable environment to be yeah. in. Yeah, you definitely, you don't, you don't want to be going in the, in the winter season. So spring and fall. Uh, or are your best bets the months that Kevin has outlined for sure. That's yeah. when most of, you know, some people have to travel in the middle of the highest part of the season. And, and we get that uh, just when you have to do that, be sure that you are, as we said before, planning, a, you know, well in advance, don't know last minute, because I mean, these pro these hotels, they do sell out and we don't want to put our clients on a park bench. When we try to avoid that when we can. What language do they speak in Ireland, Kevin? Well, uh, they speak English, uh, but there's four, like four dialects of, or four different regions of the Irish accent that there are some accents and in, in primarily rural and then uh, more of the, of the northern counties of Ireland where... I, I can't understand. They're speaking English, but the accent is so strong. I have no clue what they're saying. If you want to have some fun, go to YouTube and look up Irish accents. And there's some samples in there of people speaking Irish accent with an Irish accent that you 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 have. It has to have subtitles. Oh, but, I love that. I'm going to I'm going to scout around for a couple of those to put up on our, our uh, YouTube channel. I think that would be fun to just have up there uh, and, and where people could, could, if they log into our channel, they can can hear some of that. that that's cool. There is the old Irish Gaelic language, though, uh, and all the road signs are both in English and, 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 and in Irish. It's one of the oldest written and spoken languages in the world. Uh, so, uh, you do hear it occasionally. Uh, there are television stations that broadcast exclusively in Irish. Uh, many of the sporting events have uh, Irish announcers only. Um, uh, so it's out there, but you don't, you don't run into it in the everyday world, really, uh, unless you go to a, a deeply, deeply uh, rural area of Ireland someplace.
Okay. You know, one I get asked occasionally it is they because people know we book a lot of cruises. Uh, people say, do, do Carnival or Royal Caribbean uh, sail to Ireland from Florida or New York? People want to know. And the answer to that, folks, is, is no, <laughs> they, they don't. Uh, now, uh, transatlantic sailings ha uh, happen on from, from the United States over to Europe, uh, usually in starting in late April and early May, the, the cruise lines are moving their fleets. Uh, so, so you have transatlantic. It's, it's an unusual itinerary that it calls anywhere in Ireland. I'll just yeah. tell you. I think, and they sail from Boston or New York typically. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and you're looking at Norwegian or Silver Sea, uh, Holland America, I think. Yeah. Um, those, those are the one, and you got to expect a, a lot of days at sea. <laughs> right, right. And, and they're, uh, you know, uh, uh, Cunard does transatlantics year round. It's the one cruise line that does do transatlantics year round, but they, they tend to, to, uh, stop in Southampton. Now, uh, all of that said, there are some cruise itineraries, but they, they don't sail from the U.S. They sail from somewhere. Usually some uh, they'll depart from either somewhere or, uh, around the coast of France or they will be departing from Southampton. Uh, and they will circ you know, circumnavigate the, the British Isles. Beautiful cruise itineraries. But folks, I'm going to tell you, usually these are the higher end, the ultra premium cruise lines and, and the luxury lines, but they do wonderful itineraries. So if this is something you want to do, uh, you want to do a British Isle sail, the sailing that includes Ireland, we can certainly help you with that. But they don't normally, you're not going to find something with, with Ireland if you sail from New York or Florida. It's just not there. Well, Kevin, Oceana, I, Oceana is one that, oh, yeah, that does, they do uh, that. Yeah. 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 They're one of the, uh, the ultra premium or I call them luxury light kind of, uh, the, they're straddling that line. They're, they're like four and three quarter star rather than full five stars, but great, great cruise experience on those. Kevin, what kind of currency do they use in Ireland and how do you exchange dollars for local currency? Well, the, uh, we use the euro, and uh, it, what I suggest to anyone that wants to travel here is uh, contact your bank and let them know that you're going to be in another country and that you will be using uh, your credit or debit card. Now, Very important, folks. Yeah. Listen to what Kevin's uh, telling you here. <laughs> If you don't do that, you run the risk of them uh, turning off your card because of an uh, unusual activity. Uh, but <clears throat> my recommendation is to, if you don't have a debit card, get a debit card. When you get to Ireland, and I don't suggest that you do one of the uh, money transfer booths at the airport, their fees are higher. Wait till you get into the city, which most people when they get here go to Dublin first and just and go to an ATM and get yourself a, 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 a few euro. Now, don't get a lot. Uh, you don't want to carry around a lot of cash. Ireland is is very, very much a cashless society, it seems like uh, I I rarely carry more than five euro in my pocket. Um, I even, if I just even go to the store and buy myself a, a cup of coffee at, at a coffee shop and a donut and it's six euros, um, I pay with, I pay with my debit card. Now, if your credit or your debit card needs to have the chip on it, if possible, uh, you um, <clears throat> will need to enter in your PIN number when you use your card. Uh, but that is, and you're going to pay, you're going to pay a little bit of a fee for using it, but it's, it's really the only way to go. And uh, 
Credit cards do not bring in American Express, thinking you can use that, or uh, a Discover, or Carte Blanc, or whatever they're called now, Diners Club, any of those types of things. Stick with uh, the Visa and MasterCard. Okay. Good Good to know. Uh, what, what about electric? This is one we're asked about for, for generally for, for any kind of international travel. Uh, do people need to bring converters? What, what's what's the situation with that? Yeah, you, you, the, the currency in Ireland is 230 volts. Uh, so if you plug in your, uh, your hair curler, which I use a lot, and uh, or I think uh, you might have burned a scorched <laughs> a little off there. <laughs> your hair dryer or anything like that make sure that there's a switch on there or that it should say on the label that the input is 120 to 240 volts can be used with this appliance if it doesn't say that do not bring it uh, it will burn up within seconds of plugging it in but you do need to have a converter uh, to because the plug configuration is different uh, you need a, a converter that's like this, and it's called a Type G. And uh, you just plug in uh, your American appliance on one side, and then this configuration is what goes into the uh, to the outlets in in Ireland. Very, very but you do good. need an adapter. Okay, yeah. and, and most laptops, any- all that kind of stuff nowadays. It's not an issue. Most most of them, almost all of them, have that 120 to 240 volt yep. notice. But check it first. And, and if you you know if you travel very, you, you can buy the kind of I call it a kit, but a package that has uh, all kinds of different plugs because they vary around Europe. So you can buy one device that that has alternative uh, kinds of configurations on the plug so you can use it uh various places as you travel around europe yeah Uh, i have i have one one plug that has a the configuration of just about every country in europe in it so yeah just a a handy dandy thing to have uh what about cell phones for for travelers who who are coming to ireland Will, will their cell phones work there uh no uh I, or yes, uh, <clears throat> if you wanted to bring your cell phone and you wanted to call back to the U.S. and talk to someone over the cell network, uh, that's not going to work. Um, what I recommend is get yourself something called like WhatsApp. Um, you can then call uh, you. Can, I talk to my brother and uh, anyone in the U S via WhatsApp and it's free as long as you have a Wi-Fi connection and you can get a Wi-Fi connection that in almost everywhere in Ireland, every hotel is going to have free Wi-Fi. The, uh, the hop on hop off buses have Wi-Fi. Um, the, the, the only problem with, if you wanted to have a phone that you, and you're self-driving, for example, and you wanted to call your B&B that you have a reservation with or something like that. Uh, I, I'm going to be honest. I really don't know what you need to do. I, I would suggest you call your, your, your phone provider, tell them where you're going, say, what do I need to do? Many of them have a service where they can temporarily put you on an international calling thing, but I, I really, I really don't know any time that we've had a, a, a group over here or something where not independent travel, but where we're taking care of them and managing their day. Um, there's no need for any of someone like that to have a phone unless they just want to use WhatsApp to call back Inter- interact with people, but yeah, check with your phone carrier. That, and Kevin, I think that that's pretty much whenever people are traveling internationally, there are so many carriers and so many plans for, for the carriers. I mean, uh, I'm with 
T-Mobile, and but I do have an international plan because I travel around frequently and it covers a lot of the globe. But it depends. You may need to add that, as you said, that that international plan. If if for any reason, I, you know, everybody's needs are different. So just check with your provider. I think, Kevin, that's that you gave the best advice there. Just check. You know, uh, I have a few more burning questions, you know, aside from what people throw our way. Uh, do you have any recommendations on must see sites that you think every traveler should try to include on their itinerary? No, I don't. Uh, there's there's something for everyone here. Uh, like I said, there's history, there's museums, there's there's food, there's there's something for everyone. I, I really I, I don't miss the the wild Atlantic Way um, where the Ring of Kerry is and the and the 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 cliffs of Moore. Uh, you, you don't want to miss that. Uh, I, I don't know. I, I guess just plan on spending 10 days here and seeing it all. Okay. I think that's great advice too. And here again, good, good, great advice, Kevin, because people are different. My, my idea of the perfect trip to Ireland is going to be very different perhaps than, than my clients. So uh, yeah. one of the things that is very important for us to do is to talk. So we have a good understanding of, of you, what you like you know, and what you don't like, it's just as important. Uh, so we put together the trip that, that meets your preferences and what you want to do. So uh, uh, what about it? What about on the other side of the coin? Do you think there are, are any of the iconic sites that are just overhyped and, and, and more are just kind of, do you think, uh, kind of a waste of time for the most part? Uh, don't bother with trying to kiss the Blarney Stone. Uh, it's just a tourist trap. And with the way things are in the world today, do you really want to put your lips on something that a thousand other people have? Um, yeah, uh, think about it, folks. <laughs> that's the first thing on my list. Uh, probably you've heard about the iconic Temple Bar in Dublin. Uh, don't waste your time. If you want to get a pint of Guinness or, or in, enjoy a drink, don't go to the Temple Bar. It's a big touristy area and they charge you twice as much as what you really have to spend. Um, and this is probably going to be controversial, but I'm not a fan of the Book of Kells. Okay. Uh, it's, it's an, if you're not familiar, it's a ninth century manuscript that was written in, 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 in Latin and it's very ornate and colorful. Uh, I don't remember how much tickets are to see it, but you stand in a long line, you see a lot of history and you see under glass, two pages of the actual book of Kells, uh, surrounded by a bunch of people hovering over a display case. The rest of the time you see, you can read through, uh, see some of the history and read about it. It's, it's interesting, but to me, uh, you get to see what's called uh, the the long room, the li uh, the big library. I can't, um, which is very I know what cool. You're talking about my mind is yeah, yeah, uh, and that's 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 neat too. But it's 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 a lot of people for something that in my mind was not great, but Just like, other people oh. may actually love it. Uh, and the other thing to pass is the lep the leprechaun museum. <laughs> Just pass <laughs> on that. And and this this is probably the that's the temple bar. That's probably what people have seen and heard of and all that. But, so pass by, get the picture, forget the rest of the experience, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. My opinion only. Some mm -hmm. people, like I said, the Book of Kells is that's a controversial one. A lot of people love it. Uh, uh, I've been there twice. That's enough. Okay, real good. Uh, anything, Kevin, that you think could surprise the traveler when they first visit Ireland? I don't know if it's a surprise, but I think it's a shock <clears throat> to people when they first get outside of Dublin to see just really how green the Emerald Isle is. That's why they call it that. Uh, 
because we, we talked earlier about the, the rain, because of that, things are very lush and green. Uh, and you see great expanses of, of fields and, and it's very lovely. And I think a lot of people are, are kind of su- a little bit more surprised at, at, at what that looks like when, than what they expected. And then this really isn't a surprise for first time travelers, but it's a caution, a warning. Uh, if you're walking in anywhere in Ireland or Dublin or any city, uh, remember to look the opposite direction when you're getting ready to cross the road. Uh, the, they're driving on the other side. Your first instinct as, as we grew up growing up in the, the U.S. is you look one way and then the other and then you cross the road. Well, you have to reverse that. And that's something I see a lot of um, uh, close calls. So I don't know. Just kind of watch your step when uh, when you're traversing the, those villages and things. Yeah. Good, good advice. And also just watching, I, I think, watching your steps as you with lots of uh, cobblestones and, and older roads and, and they're windy and twisty if you're doing self-drive. Uh, so, so just kind of th- some things to, to be aware of. Kevin, you know me. I'm always interested in hearing about the food. Uh, yeah. uh, is there any anything in particular as far as uh, dishes that that regional dishes that that people should try while they're there, or a specific restaurant that you would recommend in Dublin or or outlying areas. Well, you got to have a, a, a pint of Guinness. Whether you are a drinker or not, you got to try one. And you don't have to buy a pint. That's, I mean, that's typically how it's ordered. You say, I'll just have a pint. You can, uh, you can order a glass uh, to try it uh, or visit, uh, visit the, uh, the uh, Guinness factory where it's made in Dublin and you get a free pint um, there uh, as part of the thing. But um, scones. Uh, are, are popular. I don't know if you're familiar with a scone. It's kind of like a, a, a biscuit type mm-hmm. thing uh, many times with currants or, or raisins in it. Mm-hmm. Uh, Irish soda bread, um, mm-hmm. black pudding, which mm-hmm. a lot of people think it sounds disgusting. Uh, mm-hmm. I mean, it's, it's made of pork and beef blood and, and uh, pork fat and, and, oatmeal or barley or something and it's served at breakfast typically. Uh, but it, maybe, uh, maybe it, I don't know. I really, I like it mixed in with some scrambled eggs, something like that. But some okay. people even have it on pizzas and hamburgers here. Um, mm. uh, don't, uh, don't come over here thinking that, um, corned beef and cabbage is traditionally Irish. It's not, uh, that's, oh, wow. It's uh, that's something Burst that, my bubble, Kevin. <laughs> uh, it's something that uh, you don't even re- you rarely even see. It's I think that's a the immigrants to from Ireland into New York were looking for something inexpensive to buy. They were destitute, and uh, corned beef is actually a Jewish dish. Mm-hmm. And for some reason, the Irish took uh, started uh, really enjoyed it because yeah. of the cost of it you yeah your cost of it now can take your breath away i'm telling right. you it can it's gone <laughs> it's uh certainly not uh uh when you're trying to economize it's not something you would be serving these days over here now this is this is what you cannot pass up on oh, this wow. is considered the full irish breakfast and uh here you get uh, your bacon or what they call rashers here sausages eggs you get the black pud, black pudding, uh, baked beans, tomatoes, mushrooms, toast, potatoes, and a cup of tea. And Woo, that's my word. Anywhere you go, you're going to be able to order a full Irish breakfast pretty much. Wow. That would, can, that would kind of look like a week's worth of breakfast for <laughs> me, but uh, wow. That's I can't a recommend any specific restaurants or anything. Okay. I, I can't think of anything right now. 
Well, Kevin, that was great. I, you know, time goes so quickly. I can't even believe. Uh, I just want to thank you again for taking time to join us uh, uh, on this episode of Let's Talk Travel. Uh, I know that you keep a busy schedule and I, we just appreciate your insights and, and on the ground experience to be able to share with our listeners uh, so that they know a little bit more about what to expect on their uh, bucket list trip to visit Ireland. And this evening, folks, we, you know, we always give have a giveaway. And this evening, I am going to give away something very special. These travel coasters. These are stone coasters. You all have all seen those stone coasters. And this is travel themed coasters. And I'm going to give this away. I want you to enter in the comments right now. If you're a live listener only, just the word Ireland, nothing else. And somebody who's watching live will have their name drawn to win these fabulous stone coasters. And I'll get them in the mail to you uh, very shortly after our drawing. Thanks again, Kevin. Thank you to everybody who took time out of your schedules to join us this evening. We so appreciate you as well. And stay tuned for another episode next week of Let's Talk Travel. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye, everyone.